Welcome. Thank you so much for coming. And as David says, um, I'm Vicky Burnett. I'm Senior Consultant with the Charity Retail Consultancy. And we're going to talk today about how hospices can uh, meet the challenges of the pre-love boom. So a little bit about <laughs> us. Um, we have uh, we are the um, first ever Charity Retail Consultancy. We were established in 2010 um, by my colleague, Jane Cartwright. We are uh, both charity retailers, as are our associates. We have worked in the sector for many, many years including various hospices. So when I was 15, I was a shop volunteer at St Luke's Hospice in Sheffield, where my mum was a nurse for many, many years. So hospices are in my blood, if you like. And then I was head of retail at St Gemma's Hospice in Leeds for 12 years. And I was also um, head of retail and then director of income generation at Martin House Children's Hospice. So at the consultancy, we work with charity retailers of all kinds, all nationals, locals, um, all different shapes and sizes to work with you to be the best you can be. Um, and we partner with Charity Retail Association to deliver Charity Retail Learning, which is an online learning platform, which I'll talk a little bit more about later. And as David says, we're the HQP's Charity Retail Consultancy. So the session today, we're going to talk about three things, really. And the key, the most important thing, really, is about retail strategy. So about having how taking a strategic approach to retail can really support the delivery of your goals. Uh, we're going to look at staff and volunteer recruitment and retention, which is a big issue for the sector uh, as a whole, not just for hospices, but um, across the whole charity retail sector at the moment. And at, at the end, we're going to talk a little bit about kind of the, the big trends that are happening in charity retail at the moment. So if you do decide that you want to uh, invest and grow, uh, you know, you know what's going on and, and the good places to put your money and your investment. So before we start on that, I just wanted to kind of talk about the market a little bit. because so we've said, obviously, that charity retail is, is experiencing a boom. So I thought I'd share this information with you. <laughs> so these um, uh, the data here is comes from the Charity Retail Association benchmarking surveys, which they run every quarter. So just to kind of plug for the CRA, they are an amazing membership body. Many of you will be members. But if you aren't, I hugely encourage you to join. They are absolutely fantastic. They do lots of really brilliant things. And just one of them is is research, um, which is really beneficial to the sector. So, so do check out their research if you're a member. If you're not a member, please do join. So the last um, benchmarking survey showed another really positive quarter for charity retail sales. And that's on the back of really, um, you know, a, a long period now of, of increasing sales. Post, post pandemic, charity retail has been flying. So in the last quarter, only five charities reported a year on year decline and over 50% recorded a year-on-year -year growth of more than 10%. And then across the board, year-on-year -year growth was 9.7%, which is phenomenal growth, and particularly if we think that we're in a time of um, a cost-of-living crisis, and mainstream retail is really struggling. And um, charity retail, once again, has outstripped um, mainstream retail. Um, during the lockdown, lots of charities rightly focused on their uh, e-commerce offer and we know that a lot of people have moved to shopping online however I think it's always really important just to kind of check ourselves with that because the last survey showed that 96.2 percent of all income still came from bricks and mortar shops so it's still a, a massive proportion of charity retail income comes from high street shops or, or, or bricks and mortar so it's really important to bear that in mind and then it's fantastic to see that the average shop in the last um quarterly survey was earning over three and a half thousand pound a week and 40 percent were looking at a weekly average income of over 3k which is a a real sort of big jump over the last few years so we can start to see some of those really big numbers coming through so while I, I do apologize my screen is sort of jumping forward and I don't really know why but I will hopefully keep up with it anyway um so the first thing really is, is why would we think about having a strategy and it, the key thing absolutely is about ensuring retail delivers your hospice's strategic goals. Um, so it is, there are lots of ways that retail can do that. And we will talk about that as we go through, but you know, your, your hospice strategy is so important and retail can really support with that. It will give you a clear plan and a direction of travel. And I mean, I think what we do often see is that obviously most hospices will have a strategy. Quite often they'll have an income generation strategy. And within that, there will be mention of retail, but quite often we find that there, that there is no specific retail strategy and, and having one can really help. So like I say, it can give you this clear plan and a direction of travel, you know, where you're going, what you're aiming for. It helps kind of guide and, and inform those future decisions that you're making about retail. So when you're faced with something, 
in a year or two years time, you're thinking, what, what should I do? You can refer back to your strategy. You can see if it'll keep you on track in terms of making sure that you are, again, working to those hospice st strategic goals. Um, a great thing to do as well is it involves others and brings them along with you. So uh, making sure that, you know, you can take people on that journey with you. It's a great way of developing a strategy to to engage not just your retail team, but your trustees, your senior team and the wider hospice team. And it helps you know what to expect from your chain. So if, for example, you decide you're going to invest in some refits because you've not done any for a while and that's going to take a hit on the profit for a year. But eventually then you're going to see the return the following year. If you all know that that's going to happen, when you sort of see a drop in your profits, everybody's not panicking and thinking, oh, no, 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 this is not working. It helps you plan and make good decisions and it helps you measure your success. So it gives you that base uh, against which you can measure your success or what you can see if things are going awry. So it's a fantastic framework to work within. So when you're looking at developing a retail strategy, start with your hospice strategy. So what do you want from your hospice? And ideally your retail and your um, hospice strategy times would align. So it might be, you know, that you're, you're doing both, working on both at the same time, or you, you, you're working for the same period. We always generally suggest three years, I think some people go to five, but at the moment in such sort of uncertain times, I think three years is appropriate. But when you're thinking about your strategy, obviously income generation, when you're thinking about retail is, is key. So how much do you need to raise to support patient care? And what proportion of that do you need to come from your retail operation? So you can start to kind of drill down at all your income streamlines and, and see what you need from retail. You might have a particular area of focus in your patch. So it could be, for example, that you have an area, uh, a community that you particularly want to reach that aren't engaging with the hospice currently, and you'd like to get, you know, bring those um, closer to you. So opening a shop in that area amongst that community may be a way of doing that. So that could be a way of raising your profile, raising your engagement. You might think about what are the key areas the hospice is focusing on uh, that, that retail can support. So it could be, for example, if you were um, <clears throat> working on developing, I don't know, like a, a children's bereavement service for your hospice you know is there something that that retail can help with that and so that might be about messaging so that's you know shops on the high street and uh, talking about what your service might be it might be talking to your retail teams so they can spread the word to the community um it might be kind of engaging corporates that can support with retail that that kind of the, that thread leads through to sort of building and, and delivering the service that you need so so what is it that you want to do and how can retail deliver that? And I think thinking more broadly and not just focusing on income is a really good approach. So you can see that there are lots of different ways that retail can help. And really key is what are your organisational values? And I think, you know, most hospices now have, you know, mission, vision and values. And one of the things that we do see very often is that retail is quite other to, to the sort of central hospice team. So that internal engagement piece is really important. And by sharing those organisational values and making sure that they run through the whole of the organisation, not just the clinical and the hospice based teams, but also in retail is really, really important. So looking at where are those connections between the hospice strategy and retail. The next thing really is to look at the external environment and lifting your head up and looking out is one of the most important things you can do in all aspects of things, but certainly from retail. And I know when I was at St Gemma's, I joined the Charity Retail Association board I served on for uh, many years, and that was such a valuable experience for me because it really helped me see what was going on externally and to hear from other charity retailers who I shared a high street with um, what, you know, what were their priorities, what were the things that they thought were happening. And so, you know, and that's sort of the big nationals as well as other local charities. But looking at what, like, what are other people doing and what can you learn from them? And, you know, as a sector, as a charity retail sector, it's an incredibly open sector. People are really happy to share. The Charity Retail Association does a brilliant job bringing people together, but also there are hospice networks. There are retail groups um, um, in all of the different areas across the country where re charity retailers from hospices come together on a, you know, a sort of, I don't know, six monthly basis to chat. Informally, you could talk to your neighboring hospices or people that you've got connections with, find out what they're doing and ask them, you know, what's worked for them, what's not working for them and learn. Think about, you know, externally is a now a good time to invest and grow. And I would say currently, yes, look at the market. We've got this incredibly buoyant market. Free loved is absolutely top of everybody's agenda. 
because of sustainability and because of cost of living primarily. So is the market ready for more? Is it is, is it ready to, to take a, a extra shops or, or, or an extra pre-loved offer? How does your chain benchmark against the rest of the sector? So can you see where you are doing well and where you are doing less well? Where is there room for growth? And as well as the CRA research, there's also the charity fine. It's a charity shop survey that comes out once a year. The um, you can submit your data in July, and it's normally published in October. And this is a fantastic resource to benchmark, and it gives you some really key sort of benchmarking about income, profitability, staff costs, um, shop floor size rents all sorts of stuff so you can really have a look at that and say okay so we're doing well here but i can see we benchmark poorly there so here's a play area where we can potentially grow and learn um look at the big trends and like i say i'm going to be talking about those later and see what's going on externally and you know don't underestimate the you know influences um and social media and what's going on so go on you know TikTok on instagram on on you know the social media platforms use your marketing teams if you have them to, to see what um, uh, influencers are doing. And there are so many people talking about pre-love fashion online and that can really help you understand what people are looking for and, 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 and where your opportunities lie. And then internally too, it's really important to think about for you as a hospice, what are the possibilities and what are your limitations? So it might be that, you know, you have a geographical patch that you're in and you might think, well, actually we've got a shop on every high street. I can't think of anywhere else we would go that might be a limitation but then what you might think is okay so if we've got the shops on all of those high streets could we take another shop could we take a different kind of shop a furniture shop a books and music shop for example something like that or you know could we um change the way that we look so so think about what is it that would uh support your growth and development and what might limit it um one of the limitations might be finances so if you don't have a lot of reserves you don't have the money to invest or you don't have an appetite in your organization to invest in terms of finances in terms of resources that's going to you know help to frame what you can do and the way you can move forward with your strategy or if you or conversely obviously if you will invest and you've got some money and you want to do it that that will that will also do the same you need to think about what your infrastructure looks like, not just in retail, but kind of more broadly. And I'll talk about that a little bit um, in, in a moment. So what infrastructure do you have in place to support your plans? And I can't stress enough how important it is to speak to your people. So speak to your teams, speak to your shop shop volunteers, your, your shop managers, your retail teams, your senior team, your trustees. Gather people's ideas and thoughts. The sooner you engage them in, 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 in the strategic process, the more bought in they will be and the more engaged they will be when it comes to actually delivering it. So gather people's ideas, knowledge and experience from wherever you can and take them on the journey with you. So the kind of things then you might want to include in your strategy, uh, here's a few things. So um, your team, so your staff and your volunteers. So you might uh, want to think about, for example, what um, uh, staffing model you have. So some hospices still have a volunteer led model. They might decide that you want to move over to paying staff or not. Um, you might decide that because of the volunteer shortages, you've looked at the external environment, you can see that volunteer recruitment's a challenge. Actually, what we're going to do is we're going to invest in a higher FTE per shop in order to uh, make sure that we're, you know, we can keep the shops open and we've got enough people to keep them, um, you know, performing at their best. So, so think about how that's going to look for you. Infrastructure, as I just mentioned, this is really thinking about. So, I want to grow. I, I might have five shops now. I want to get to ten shops. Can my finance team, IT, maintenance, HR, can they all support an extra five shops? You know, what is the kind of ripple effect? Because all of those teams are going to need to, you know, offer something to your retail organisation. So at what point in your strategy are you going to say, actually, at this point, we're going to need to invest in another maintenance person? Or at this stage, we're going to need to kind of bring in a, a, an extra 0.2 FTE in our HR to, to help with recruitment and staffing around retail. Thinking about your resources. So if, for example, one of your strategic goals is to grow organically, um, you know, 30 percent on a certain a couple of shops that you might have that you think are underperforming. And what you think you need to do is get more stock. Or if you're opening new shops and you need more stock, where is that going to come from? How are you going to get that? So 
think about kind of what you're going to need to do in order to deliver what you're looking for in your strategy. Where's your investment going to have to go? That might be again like bit out. So you might need to, um, you know, you might not have invested in your shops for a while and you need to fit them out. How much is that going to cost? Where's that going to come from? Growth, obviously, is something hopefully you'll all be thinking about in the strategy. And where's that coming from? So is that going to be taking your existing shops and helping them do better? Is it going to be opening new shops? Is it going to be a combination of the two? Is it going to be that you might decide to segment? So you might say, well, actually, what we've currently got is 10 shops that are all kind of traditional charity shops, if you like. But I think in that area, that community might respond better to a value offer. Or in that community, they might respond better to a boutique offer. Or in this community, I think there's space for, for example, a book and music shop. So thinking about segmenting your offer, and that's something that charity retailers have been doing really over the last decade and to great success. And then, of course, thinking about your e-commerce offer. What part will that play? How is that going to work? How can you grow that? Think about your customer, as I was just saying, you know, different customers want different things in different places. Who are you aiming at? And that might be, again, thinking about those hospice strategic goals. It's we want to engage more younger people. Therefore, we want to offer this this type of shop. I was talking to Marie from um, St. Gemma's Hospice, uh, St. Luke's Hospice in Sheffield the other day. And she was saying, you know, they, their uh, volunteer age at their new shop on the moor in Sheffield is eight, average age 24. So that's a whole new young group of people who you can take on that journey with you and engage them with the hospice. It's really important to think about messaging and communications. And one of the things that we see all of the time is, you know, you might have a shop that you go in and you do not know what charity shop you're in. Nothing in there says anything about the organisation. And, you know, hospices are full of incredible stories, uh, as are charity shops. So you've got the story of the hospice and what you do and how you want to communicate that to your public, to your communities. You've got the story of the people working in your shops, so your volunteers, your staff. I was in a shop, um, uh, St. Clair Hospice down in Essex, once chatting to a volunteer, said, oh, what made you volunteer? She said, oh, my husband and I set the hospice up 20 years ago. And it was one of those like amazing tingle moments. But, you know, what a story that was. And I thought, wow, you know, how amazing. And she told me all about it. But, well, how engaging is that to have all those stories? And then the stories of the products. So where the products have come from. I know St. Gemma's had a, went viral with a wedding dress that came in with a little note on it about the story of this wedding dress and the, the story was shared all, literally all over the world. And also the story of where things go. So I was talking to somebody from St. Rocco's Hospice the other day and she said, a guy bought a bag and he'd taken that bag and he'd been all over the world and he was saying, oh, it's been to this country. That's, you know, fantastic stories. Tell them, share them with your supporters. People love storytelling, as we know, in the hospice world. So, you know, using social media and, and, and your stores to do that. So how are you going to do that through retail? Creating a space for innovation, you know, have you an appetite to innovate and perhaps to fail and learn, which is fine. It's a good thing to do still. But, you know, are you going to create a space in your strategy for new ideas, try new things? And then, of course, it must have some income and expenditure. What is it all going to do to your bottom line? So, um, you know, the more early on in the strategy, the more detailed you're going to be. But obviously some headline figures for each year about what are you expecting to come out of your strategy um, in terms of profit. So once you've got your strategy and you're up and running, it's really important then to monitor it. So the really key thing is don't do all of that work, put it in a drawer and forget about it. It needs to be something that is lived and that you are, you know, it should form the basis of everything you do. And I know when I was, you know, the strategies that I've developed for retail have been my Bible. They've been the thing that I've gone back to all of the time to, to check progress, to make sure that we're, we're staying on track. So for you, uh, you know, leading, um, the retail operation and also for the for the whole of the organization the whole of the hospice and particularly the retail team it's very important to be constantly referencing the strategy you know drawing down an operational plan that's timed so you know where you're going and you can see when you're successful you can see and and share those successes when you're meeting your your targets and also it helps to see when you sort of start to kind of go off track a little bit and you can say well actually you know we, we were going to do this by then. We haven't been able to. What do we need to do? How can we flex to make sure that we are delivering what we said we were going to do? You know, obviously measure your income uh, very regularly. Weekly is is great. You know, I've always shared um, every week with every shop what every shop is taking so everybody can see how people are doing. And also it's great to share that kind of we used to, when I was at Martin House, we did a Monday morning catch up for all the heads of 
and everybody used to sort of you know do an update and we always said this is how much money we've taken every week in retail and again that's that internal engagement piece just letting people understand what retail is doing how it contributes you know share your successes and if you're struggling you know share your challenges ask for help so a good strategy then should give you i think this is really key a time to think and plan and in retail we're always running at about 100 miles an hour it's quite operational um you know you've got a customer you've got a door to open every morning you've got to be there and so that thinking time sometimes is sacrificed so taking the time out to think and plan look around you and look up is really really valuable and you know don't look up just at the start of your chat of your strategy you know do it repeatedly all the way through what what's happening now what's going on so that next time you're, you're you're doing your strategy you can see how things are going to go it gives you that sense of purpose and a better understanding of your business so everybody really knows what retail is there for and how it's performing is it doing well is it not doing well we can measure success you know we have a way of saying i think this is good it's not just you know what are you doing what's that individual shop doing what's our shops doing within our hospice but how are we benchmarking against the sector and i remember again you know having a shop at st Gemma's quite early on and uh it we had a, a manager that manager left it went up it did really well and we were really delighted but actually when that manager left and another manager came in we did even better so we were thinking that this looked good but actually this was good and if we looked you know up and out and see what other people are doing we're much able to understand and and, and know what what we can expect and I think it is a, this real thing about kind of bringing everybody together and bringing retail to the forefront of the organisation and realising its full potential. And, you know, retail, I mean, I love, I mean, it might come across, I love charity retail. It is amazing. It's a wonderful thing. It has been one of those things that's kind of, um, apologies, go back, has been one of those things that's been um, quite often sort of, like I say, other sort of tucked away, it just goes on and, and rumbles on in the background. But to, it's really important to celebrate it. Charity retail is your hospice on the high street. It is that they are your ambassadors in the community. It's so important to get it right because quite often a shop will be the very first contact somebody ever has with your hospice. The first, even if they don't come in the shop, they walk past it, they might donate, they might shop there, they might even volunteer there. But that experience is going to inform their opinion of you as an organisation. And if that person has a bad experience and then needs to access your services, that's going to really impact on how they feel about, you know, have, getting your services. So getting it right is absolutely fundamental, absolutely key. Never underestimate that. So that's a kind of a whistle stop tour of, of, of the strategy side of things. So I'm going to move on now to, to recruitment. And again, there is a really great uh, benchmarking survey that the Charity Retail Association do every year, the workforce survey. So these this data is from uh, 2023. Um, and we had 187,200 volunteers and 26,000 employees working in charity retail uh, this year. Whilst that's a lot, uh, pre-pandemic, I think we had about 230,000 volunteers working in the sector. So we can see it's really fallen away. We've had about a 20% decline in numbers. So it's, it is a big challenge currently. 77% of respondents said they struggled to recruit volunteers. And kind of more alarmingly, I think 31% said they found it hard to retain them. 67% said, said it was somewhat or very difficult to recruit employees. And this is something that people are saying to us all of the time. And I think part of that is about what we pay, how we pay our shop managers teams. It is a bit of a drum and banging at the moment. So that median shop manager salary is 21,800, which is just £11.98 an hour. So not that much higher than minimum wage. And what I would say, the question that you should be asking yourselves is, are we paying our retail teams at a, a rate appropriate to their role? Some of you will have um, job evaluation schemes. If you do, you know, it's really important to, to benchmark retail against the rest of the organisation. We went through that process at Gemma's. It was really valuable. It did put up our ch charity shop um, uh, team's salaries. I think we our shop managers were on a four, I think, on the agenda for change um, pay scales. And... Um, you know, it it transformed the quality of the people who came, our retention, you know, people felt valued. You know, it is a very, very responsible job. It has a lot of, you know, they have to working on their own. They're responsible for a building, your reputation, money, people. You know, it's a, a multifaceted role that is very difficult and we should be paying appropriately for that. So I would 
say, ask yourself that question, do we pay appropriately for the roles that we have in our retail team? So overarchingly though, thinking about, uh, about uh, uh, recruitment, I think, again, like a strategy, it's really important to take that step back and have a think, are we, how, what are we doing? Should we, are we just doing the things we've always done? And if they're not working anymore, how do we need to change? So take that strategic approach, look at saying, you know, what will our staffing levels be in our shops? How much should we pay people? What is the rewards? What are the other rewards about working with us? Look at kind of your recruitment processes, your job adverts, your job descriptions. Do they reflect what's happening now? So I know, um, you know, do, do they kind of put, put the best foot forward? Do they tell the people who might be interested in your role what the job is? And I know um, uh, Nat from uh, Acorns Hospice was talking at the AGM recently, um, at the CRA AGM this week, and was saying that they changed their shop manager's name to community shop manager, which immediately starts to kind of shift what that role is and starts to kind of, I think for me, that would make it sound a little bit more interesting and, you know, empowering all these kind of things. So are the things that you're doing, are the way that you're presenting yourself, is it current, is it relevant? And very importantly, is it legal? Are the people who are undertaking the recruitment, are they trained to do that? You know, recruitment practices are changing. You know, quite often now we're seeing people giving questions out in advance of the interview. Uh, so people have a chance to think about those questions before they turn up. So that it's not just about testing how you cope there and then in the moment. It's about getting a broader view. So what are new and good recruitment practices and are the people who are recruiting for you able to do that properly and well? And really thinking about, re about recruitment as a two way process. So it's not just about the applicant, you seeing if the applicant is right for you. It's about the applicant understanding if you're right for them. So it's important to put your best foot forward. My experience of hospices is that they are wonderful places with amazing values and, you know, great, great places to work. You know, make sure you're telling that story when you're when you're recruiting, you know, sell yourself to your um, to your potential employees. One of the challenges around retail, and I think similar with, you know, nursing jobs, for example, is that need to be kind of in a particular place at a particular time, which after lockdown and everybody were moving to working from home, or a lot of people doing that, people have started to feel like they want that level of flexibility. And certain jobs don't give that in the same way that others do. So, for example, if you're an office-based person, it's quite easy to work from home generally. If you're shop or ward-based or whatever, it's not. And so that's one of the things that reasons, I think, why we're seeing these challenges. But there are ways that you can do that. And I think, you know, so how can you be flexible with those roles? And I know like when we were at St. Germans, we would say, you know, as long we put a, a framework and a criteria around it. So we said, as long as you're meeting budget, as long as, you know, you're doing the hours that you're contracted to do, you can be flexible with how you deliver those hours. So some managers would come in early and they would build up a bit of flu time and then they would take that within two weeks. They, it meant they could have an afternoon or they would do a four and a half day, you know, compressed hours into four and a half days. But as long as the shop's open and as long as they're seeing all the volunteers and as long as, you know, so you can you can put those kind of that framework in place. But it is possible to be flexible in retail. And also just that whole thing about demonstrating care, about talking about that and making sure, for example, you know, really common. Most shop managers never get a lunch break. You know, if they do get a lunch break, they're sitting in some kind of, you know, perched on a stall by a sorting bench in the back room with people going oh can you come and do a refund can you come and do this you know they don't get a break and um it's very hard for them to leave the shop quite often during if they have if they're short on people i'd say that's a problem if you can't let your staff take a, a, a lunch break that's an issue so think about how can we deal with those things what can we do to make sure that we are demonstrating care and making sure that we're giving our teams what they need Absolutely fundamental to all recruitment, obviously, it's about inclusivity and how can you be inclusive and are you demonstrating your inclusivity? You know, what do you do to tell all members of your community that you want them to come and work with you? So how do you show that? And like, for example, we run a, a pride uh, window display competition um, every year and, you know, lots of, of charities now celebrate pride in their shops. That's a great message to say, look at us, we're an inclusive, we are an inclusive organisation, but Importantly, you know, make sure that the team are on board so that um, uh, if somebody, you know, does come who is perhaps not your, you know, doesn't fit the same profile as other staff members, that they are going to feel welcome when they come and work with you. But think about EDI and how that impacts on, on, on the team that you have. 
and really basically be a good employer. You know, it's really easy now for people to say if they don't like you and or if they do like you. And, you know, online and word of mouth reputation spreads. There is a Facebook group, a charity shop manager Facebook group that can be quite, uh, you know, people are not frightened to say about what they think. So if they think that you, you are a good employer, they will tell people. If they think you're a bad employer, they'll say that too. You know, that it's really important to kind of build your reputation all of the time. And then just I put loan working in just because it is a, a, a kind of big issue at the minute for, for charity retail. So, you know, quite often staff are being left working on their own, you know, because they can't have the, don't have the volunteers and staffing levels don't afford, you know, two people in there at the same time. What you have to think is that's going to happen. It is going to happen. So what do you believe as an organisation, as a hospice, you want? How do you want to manage that? Do you say we're never going to do loan working? We don't accept that. That's fine. Uh, what are you going to do then when it when it occurs you're shutting the shop how does that work if you're saying okay we are okay with loan working what you get safeguards are you putting in place to make sure somebody is okay and to make sure that you know, obviously your resources are okay so I think don't shy away from it it's hard loan working is a hard question but it is one that really needs addressing to make sure that you know if somebody is taking a role with you that they don't feel kind of abandoned and that they're sort of sat in a shop on their own all the time it's not an efficient way to run the shop either so actually what you might say is do you know what we're just going to pay two people and we're going to have somebody in we're going to make sure we've always got two paid staff in so that if there you know is an issue we're not we're going to really reduce those um loan working uh, situations so they're all just things to think about that might contribute to um to your recruitment but of course the best thing you can do is not need to recruit in the first place and to work with the talent that you do have so think about the people you've got. You know, do you have a succession plan? If in your strategy you're thinking about growth, what you might need to think is, OK, so when we've got five shop, more shops, we're going to need a, an, an area manager. Who have we got now who's in the chain who might be interested or might be capable of taking on a role? Or how can we support everybody in the team to want to kind of move up and, and to, to take on new skills and grow so that they're in a good position to take those um, more senior roles when they come through and similarly with volunteers through to becoming paid staff if that's what they want to do so think about succession planning think about you know um communication so acknowledging talent so you know talking to people about you know saying gosh you know you're so great have you thought about you know doing anything else or we'd love you to go and support another shop when they when it opens or th this shop's struggling a bit I think they'd really benefit from your um <clears throat> experience and expertise you know, sharing vacancies. So at St Gemma's, our baseline was whenever we had a new a vacancy, which was generally because we had a new shop, so we had great retention, um, we would put that out internally first. So we'd say, if anybody's interested in moving, it might not be to that shop, uh, but if, you, if you're interested in moving shops, let us know. Everybody was, put, you know, people who were interested in moving would say, yeah, I'm interested in moving. I want the new shop or I'm quite interested in going there. And then we would see whether that was, we always had a recruitment process. Everybody was always interviewed, but basically we took it internally first. And then if we didn't fill a role internally, we would advertise externally. But more often than not, the manager would, managers would move around, would slot into each other's roles and take on new shops. And then we'd be recruiting into the kind of the, the deputy role more than the manager role. Or it might be, you know, deputies moving up to become shop managers, which was great. Um. Trainee schemes can be really helpful as well in terms of kind of if you can't get somebody who's kind of ready cooked, if you like, who hasn't already got the, the skills and experience you need, bringing somebody in who's got the potential to do that is a great way of doing it. And I did this at Oxfam many, many years ago on a volunteer basis. I was getting lots of people applying for shop managers jobs who had lots of skills, but not people management skills. And so we created a volunteer management trainee scheme. Uh, that we actually end with a, a waiting list to join and we take them through and, and teach them about being a manager and about management skills, as well as the kind of the practical elements of being a, a working in a shop. And I know that St. Luke's in Sheffield, again, they've I've seen that they've advertised for, for a paid version of that role. So a trainee scheme to take people up. So and again, you know, there are also things like apprenticeships and things, of course, that you can bring people in on and grow your own talent. Um, and then, of course, learning and development is, is a really important part. And I will talk about that in, in a second. Um, so that's a really important part of, of it should be part of your strategy. So in terms of volunteering, then it's it's the perennial issue, you know, getting enough volunteers, it's always hard. 
but really thinking about, you know, starting with thinking about who are you looking for, what skills do you need, and where are those people going to be, and then going and seeking them out. And I think the thing with, um, you know, saying volunteers needed is all fine, but that doesn't tell the volunteer, the potential volunteer, what it is that you want them to do. So if you have a volunteer, for example, if you're growing your e-commerce operation and you need somebody to take pictures, so what you need is somebody who can take good photographs. Where are those people going to be? Let's look at geography clubs. Let's look at colleges. Let's look at um, Facebook groups locally that might be sharing nice photographs of things. So, you know, you're starting to kind of just be a bit more kind of pointed and specific about going and finding, being proactively, uh, proactive and seeking those people out. Um, as I've talked about before, you know, EDI, again, potential for your volunteers is absolutely fundamental. You know, making sure that you're offering um, uh, opportunities and an environment in which people from all walks of life will feel comfortable and can have can kind of take advantage of those opportunities. And, you know, thinking about homeworking. So if your shops are not able to accommodate people with certain disabilities, maybe you might be have a sort room upstairs. And so you can't bring in a volunteer who's got a mobility issue who can get up and down the stairs. But there are home, you know, think about working from home. What can we offer? So it might be social media. It might be e-commerce. It might be, um, you know, sorting and pricing jewellery, something that you can do from home. So just think a bit more flexibly about that. But like I said in the staff section, ensure a warm welcome for all from, from the existing team. So if you do all this work around EDI to, to attract new people <coughs> and then they come into your shop and say, I'd love to volunteer. It looks like you're, you're going to welcome me. And the team go, oh, you're different to us. We don't want you. That's, you know, a, a disaster, basically. So you have to get the team on board and make sure EDI kind of runs through everything that you do. Um, I think it's really important to focus on the benefits of volunteering. So I'm a volunteer. I volunteer in my local Oxfam shop on a Monday afternoon on the till. I love it. And, you know, the best way of finding the benefits is to ask your volunteers. So what is it that you love working about, you know, about working in the shops? What do you get from it? So for me, I went there when I moved to Scotland. I went there because I wanted to meet new people. I had a bit of time to go at that point in my life. Not anymore. But, you know, it's I, I wanted to fill my time. I wanted to you know, engage back in on the shop floor of a charity shop and to do that kind of work again. So there's lots of things that, you know, making friends, all those kind of things. So ask your volunteers and then tell their stories. You know, storytelling, again, is is really important. You know, get that out on social media and your newsletters and talk about what people get and what people bring for, for, for um, from volunteering. And I think, you know, again, retention is so important. Make sure when somebody comes that they get a great induction. And if you can get them to the hospice, all the better. I mean, some people don't want to come to the hospice, particularly if they've had, um, they've lost somebody there and, it, you know, they might not feel ready to come back. But if you can get people to the hospice, show them what you do, you know, and how how impactful volunteering can be and what a difference they can make. That's so powerful. You know, tell those stories regularly and, you know, tell those stories to the shop you know, the shop volunteers, you know, not just at induction, but through newsletters, through, um, you know, things like, so thank you. So it might be like we used to do birthday parties for shops and we'd invite them to hospice. They'd all have a cake and tea and we'd say, thank you so much for everything you've done. This is how much your shop's made this year. This is what it's paid for, for this many community team visits, for this many complimentary therapy sessions, for this many bereavement support sessions. So really kind of help people understand their impact and thank them for it share the successes so when you're doing things well or when you've had a really successful situation just talk about that all the time and really engage your volunteers as widely as you can with the hospice team so that they, they feel part of the bigger organization it's not just i mean it's great that we have the you know some really great sort of family feelings in it, particular shops but they are part of a wider community and it's really important to offer that <laughs> excuse me so I just want to talk about learning and development. So there, here are some stats that there was from a LinkedIn survey that basically all say the same thing, which is if you train your staff, they're more willing to stay. They want to be in the same organisation. Um, you know, retention really, really is impacted by good learning and development and also money. Now, the, the, the bottom stat is not from a charity, but from a business saying comprehensive training programmes have a 218% higher income per employee than those that invest less. So investing in your teams through learning and development 
is really, really important. And I have to say that retail is often the poor relation in hospice in the hospice world when it comes to this. So obviously you've got ongoing professional development for all your clinical teams and they have things that are happening all the time. So communication skills or, you know, you know, technical, technical um, training or EDI and all these kind of things. And quite often retail is sort of left behind. And if you are engaged, so in the mandatory training, quite often that mandatory training does not reflect their world. So I remember at St. Germans, the first time I went to a moving and handling training session, it was, you know, OK, so if you get a delivery that you can't handle, that's big or heavy, call the maintenance team, use the lift, use the trolley. Well, none of those things are an option in the shop. So immediately you are disengaging all of those people who work in retail and they're going, nothing to do. Uh, this is not for me. So so that, that training is not impactful. So having something that relates to them and resonates with them is really important. And Charity Retail Learning is, 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 an, is an online, primarily online learning uh, platform that we set up during lockdown. And I'm not going to do a big sell. I, I'm only talking about it because I know it really works and it's a really good thing for, for charity retailers. But basically, we have over 30 online courses, click-through courses that are really easy to access. They kind of, they're, from a technological point of view, they're very simple to do. So they, they don't need to have fantastic IT skills to do to look at the training. It's all totally based in a charity retail environment. So it's very um, specific to their world. So it engages with them, it resonates with them. And so you're getting much better value um, from that training. And it covers all kinds of aspects. So there's lots of mandatory training in there. So things like moving and handling, health and safety, safeguarding, security, but also things, operational things. So like, getting stock, recruiting and retaining volunteers, visual merchandising, space management, um, stock processes, all the things about being and charity retail e-commerce as well. And then also there's some well-being sessions in there too. So something sort of a bit more broad. And we're constantly adding um, new courses all of the time. So we have a subscription service, which is for a three-year service, you can subscribe. Uh, it starts at 250 time, 252 pounds per shop per annum. And that includes your entire retail team and your entire volunteer team across retail can access for that for that just that price. So, like I said, I'm not going to do a big sell, but I'm really happy to talk to you about it. And the reason I put it in here is not because I think it's about selling it, because I think it's a really good offer. And I think it's something that definitely, definitely helps with your retention and your recruitment. So finally, then, I'm just going to talk about current and future trends. So I'm just going to touch on those. So the big things that are going on, there's four things that I've kind of um, uh, looked at. So one is about sustainability. It's massive. Charity retail is fantastically good at it. Talk about it. And for, you know, many years, people didn't really talk about the fact that we were diverting, you know, thousands and thousands of tons of, 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 of goods from landfill. But people are starting to do it now. Royal Trinity Hospice here are particularly good at it. But talk about it. it doesn't have to be a big expensive campaign this is a really brilliant way of doing it um just uh, demonstrated here but talk about your sustainability community engagement is this other thing which so it's about experiential retail so it's not just about kind of you know walking in having a transaction walking out because you don't need to walk in or walk out you could do that online but having a space that really proactively engages your community you know like i said your shops are the face of your hospice on a high street and a fantastic opportunity to engage. So you might put on events. So I know this is a picture from St Barnabas Hospice, obviously promoting their colour run, which is, a, again, you know, you can really engage with your community fundraising offer through retail as they're out there on the high street. But also St Barnabas have done a couple of lock-ins at their warehouse. So people pay um, tickets, they come in the evening, they have a night, they drink St Barnabas Hospice's gin, they do some shopping. You know, it's a really lovely sort of, you know, engaging com community engagement um, uh, experience and much more experiential and really kind of embeds the hospice in in the lives and the experience so it's it's a really great way of kind of deepening your engagement with your community so 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 you know workshops you know upcycling workshops book clubs knit and natter groups the whole lot all of that kind of stuff is really great and lots of people are doing that and the other thing about that is you can do it out of hours as well so you're making more from the space that you've got is not just restricted to trading hours. You can do things in the evening as well. Uh, probably this is not a surprise to many of you. Superstores is uh, massive at the minute. This is what, you know, the huge growth in superstores from charity retail. If you don't have one, 
uh, go and see one, I would say. I would really recommend that you go and have a look at what's going on. So um, lo lots of charities are doing it. And then the nationals are really focusing on it. I was talking to a, one of the national retailers the other day and they said, that is where our focus is. We are really pushing superstores because they're doing so well for us. There was some research done pre-pandemic that showed that, that superstores were generating three and a half times the profit of, of a um, high street store. Now they are, you know, it's more expensive. They're bigger, so they cost more. Quite often the rents uh, on retail park can be high. But if, you know, strategically it's something that you want to do, you will get the return if you make sure you do it right. So what I would say is have a look, take a look, go and see what people are doing. Talk to the people who are doing it well. And um, and, and, and it's a, a really great thing to consider. The other things that superstores do is give you that opportunity to, you might, if you have a warehouse, for example, you might be able to combine that with your superstore. So you're not having to cover the cost of two separate units. You might be able to host your community team there. So there might be office space for the hospice. You might be able to, obviously you can run events and activities from there. You might you might be able to deliver bereavement cafes there, uh, bereavement support groups, all sorts of different things that you can do from a superstore. So the possibilities are endless, definitely worth looking at. And then the last one is about collaboration. And this is really sort of, you know, the focus of this, it, it, it's something that's been happening a lot, but charity supermarket is something that really sort of highlights that. And you may have heard of this. So this is uh, Wayne Hemingway from Red or Dead and Maria Chenoweth from Trade have sort of set up this this charity super, supermarket, which is a pop-up event. I know that hospices at Haven's Hospice, I think, has been involved in it. I'm sure some others too. And they pop up in different places. The first one was Brent Cross Retail Park in an old top shop. Ten charity retailers all operating in there together. And it's been a huge success and it's had pop-ups all over the country. So if the, if it is around your area, I would definitely, you know, talk to some of the retailers who have taken part in it already, see what their experience has been. Um, you know, it's a great um, awareness raiser. It's a great way for engaging different people because it's got quite a young focus to it. So that's a, a really good way of, of kind of piggybacking on something that's already happening. Or if you want to kind of collaborate yourselves, I know Harlington Hospice works with um, Age UK, Harrow, Lingdon and Brent to deliver their retail together. They partnered up to do that. So you can collaborate with other charities locally. And then the other thing is corporate. So corporates are desperate to be greener, particularly ones who are into clothing. So um, Zara, um, for example, you know, they work with several charities now to to give the things that they, their returns, their end of lines, their sort of slightly damaged goods will come in and, and be sold through the shops. We know Cancer Research and TK, TK Maxx have worked together for a long time. So look at your corporates, see what they're doing, you know, have a conversation with them and see if there are ways that you can collaborate um, either on stock, on volunteering. So corporate volunteering days, for example, there's all sorts of different things that you might be able to to do. So so collaboration is, is a great way um, of moving forwards. So um, that's everything that I was going to talk to. Like I said, a bit of a whistle stop tour, lots to say in, in a very short amount of time. But if you want to know more, if you want more help, obviously we're here and we can help you. If you are a HQP member, you get a discounted rate. So we're cheaper if you're a member of HQP. So that's a good reason to join. Um, we do all kinds of things. So health checks, reviews um, for bricks and mortar and e-commerce, mentoring, training. So all that stuff I was talking about, kind of, you know, building your talent internally. We do all of that. Recruitment support. Oh, well, you can read it anyway. We do all kinds of stuff. So do um, get in touch if, if you want to know any more or if you've just got any questions or anything at any point, um, please ask. So. Um, that QR code. My colleague Jane is a big champion of our YouTube channel, and she said, "Put put the YouTube QR code on." So we have a YouTube channel that we update all the time. That's got all sorts of charity retail things on. If you've got videos you'd like us to share of your retail operation on our YouTube channel, we're more than happy to do that. Um, and our other socials are there. So Vicky, um, Vicky yeah. I assume we'll pop the recording on there as well. Uh, yeah, and you know, probably on your site and our site, we'll host the slides as well for people to get back yeah. into it. is that okay that's absolutely fine yeah so basically we record this and we will put it yeah it'll sit on charity retail learning and you'll be able to to access it for free obviously i'll share it with your colleagues so right, that's you, it for me uh so if anybody's got any questions i'm very happy to answer any questions in the chat i think a few... through. oh somebody from the bank cross from charity supermarket, low cost, good return, a great way of volunteering across the staff team. 
we asked everyone to do. Oh, and you're doing Shepherd's Bush in Westfield. Fantastic. That's brilliant. Somebody also asked Vicky about uh, whether you can assist with interim uh, retail directoring. And I, I said that yes, and yep. contact you uh, to gain some insight there as well. Yes, absolutely. We, we, do, we do do interim work as well. Yes. Yeah. So if you've got anything, um, uh, if you've got anything coming up. So Declan, yeah, if you just drop us an email and I'll, I'll happy to have a, have, a, have a chat about that. Um, Scott Lee also asked, um, do operational benchmark exist in Compass Square Foot? I'm assuming is, is that something that uh, charity, charity retail learning has or? Uh, so that would be, I would say, get the charity, the last charity shop survey from Charity Finance. If you take part in it, you don't have to pay for the report. If you don't take part, you have to pay. But it's definitely worth having. And they have a lot of stuff in there. So they have, uh, so they don't do income per square foot, but they do do uh, average size and average rent. So you can calculate and average income. So you, uh, you well, and and they do sort of those are kind of benchmark on each organization so you can start to look and sort of draw that out yourself um but equally if you're a member of the cra and there is information that you want from a research point of view have a conversation with them and if they're able to accommodate that as part of their regular research then they may well do that for you excellent and somebody asked i don't know if you know the answer somebody did share some glass door information but do you know what the median salary is for shop managers in uh, regular retail off the top of my head, I don't. I mean, I can okay. see if I can find out. I mean, and I think it would vary so massively, which is probably why well. there isn't anything. Because, yeah. you know, if, you, if you're a Tesco superstore manager compared to, uh, I don't know, a, you know, a little, a, a small, a small, you know, little shop somewhere, that might be very different. But um, but it's probably worth, it, it would be worth looking. I mean, retail is traditionally not very well paid, but just because that's been the case in the past doesn't mean it, it should be in the future. No. Uh, he hi, Helen. Again, well, um, I just, and it's strange, I did put this in at the CRA meeting the other day. Mm. Um, and apologies to any national charities that are on this call. But part of me is really worried that we, as hospices, we're going to be squeezed out by the big boys. Um, I know you talk about the collaboration and I can only look at Wakefield and seeing what the British Heart Foundation are doing in Wakefield. The big superstores they've got, we cannot afford the, the space that they've got. And you just, and, and I know the only card we can play is the local card, but I just wonder whether this is going to happen, you know, that we're going to get squeezed, our, our market share is going to get squeezed out. I think that's a really interesting question, Helen, and I think you have hit the nail on the head, which is about your locality. And, you know, local is so important to people now. It mm. is the thing that, you know, mm. if you think about during the pandemic, everybody sort of looked inwards, didn't they? We all sort of turned to our own communities and said, how can we support each other in, the, in this? And that has carried on. And I think for me, you know, you all know, I don't need to tell your hospice people, you know, you have such an amazing thing. And hosp hospices are incredible places that do really wonderful work for the people in your community. And that is such a powerful, powerful story. And I can tell you that the nationals would give their right arm to be able to tell those stories the way that you can. And so you'll see that the British Heart Foundation and people, you know, some of the nationals will put like, you know, supporting people in Wakefield. You know, they will try to localise their national offer, but it hasn't yeah. got the same credibility that you have as a local charity. So whilst I, I can see what you're saying, and I think, you know, it might be that you might say, well, Wakefield, in Wakefield, we are never going to be able to afford a superstore. It's not something we can do. That, so strategically, that's not a space we're going to look to occupy. What we're going to do instead is we're going to really talk about our local impact, really engage our shops, with the hospice, make sure that that connection is super, super strong and that we're telling that story and that we, because you know, in Wakefield, you know your customers and that community really, yeah. really well. And with great respect to British Heart Foundation, they don't know their community really well. Their shop teams yeah. will, but you've got something there that is really precious and can't be replicated. So I would say really draw that out. You're right, and, and, and I see that, and that's what we are trying to do. But I suppose when you also see the collaboration with the major multiples with the national charities, so it's the you know the MSs with yeah. Macmillan or whoever, so yeah. you see all these big brands partnering up 
with the, you know, the supermarkets all partnering up or doing that second hand mm. market. Yeah. It is going to be so, so hard for hospices if all this builds. It's where where do we really find our our niche market? I think that is going to be that's scary for me. Yeah. I mean, what, again, what I would say is that, you know, in terms of stock, in terms of donations, the the main thing that 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 pro prompts the, the biggest driver about donating is convenience. So if it's simple, people will do it. And that's the main thing that drives it. However, the one thing that overrides that is hospices. Hospices always traditionally have got better stock and have more stock and have performed better than any other type of charity retailer. So again, you know, it's about reaching out to those individuals. So if you if you feel like, well, actually, when we haven't got any nationals or if you've got, you know, like, for example, I don't know if Burberry is still operating in West Yorkshire, but, you know, there are there are some people who would do a local thing. So St. Yeah. Gemma's, we got Joe Brown, gave some stuff. We, we got an, a, 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 um, a, um, a partnership with Joe Brown's and they gave us all of their kind of like sample stock. We got absolutely tons of it. And I believe it's still happening, you know, 10 years, 15 years later, they're still donating. And although that's a national business because they're locally based, yeah. they wanted to support their local hospice. But equally, you know, there are lots and lots of individuals who will give you stuff. And actually flooding a charity shop with, a, with lots and lots of new goods is not always what your customers want. So it's about thinking, right. what is our proposition? What have we got that's special and unique about us and that will drive people to come to us rather than anybody else and use that as well as you possibly can? Yeah. Thanks, Vicky. Thanks. I'm just having a little look through. Should hospice take a UK take a role in that i think hospice uk my, my understanding is that a lot of the stuff at hospice uk they used to have a retail steering group and then that sort of now moved over to the cra and that's what i was talking about those local hospice groups they are now being done by um the cra so but i think if you want to collaborate or if you if you're thinking you want to do something regional i know the yorkshire hospices did some advertising re, um a few years ago they did some tv advertising work together um you know talk to your local hospices and see if there's something that you can do regionally to be more impactful in terms of, you know, approaching corporates or whatever. I'm uh, just having a little look to see if there's anything else on there. Hospices are working together more strategically now. Surely this can be the case in retail as well as joint. Yeah. Um, so yeah, about hospices working together to kind of do joint superstores. I think the public love to see stuff, people working together. Like, you know, when I was at St. Gemma's, there was a Sioux Rider Hospice Wheatfields in, in Leeds and we used to have a couple of things that I mean I'm not saying it wasn't without challenges it was it was tricky at times but actually the public love it they want you to see charities working together not against each other so to create a space that is that works for kind of multiple charities in one place is is totally doable I think you know you obviously have to kind of work it all out quite carefully but um you know it, it definitely can work um, are there any more questions anybody got anything else they want to ask. How's that for timing? Oh, I want to one new message. Working together on e-commerce. Yeah. And the local hospice lottery model. Yeah. Shows how well this can work. Absolutely. Yeah. You know, it might be that you might share an e-commerce space. You could, you know, if you want, if you needed somewhere to, to, to do it all together, instead of setting up lots of different kind of photography spaces and this, that, and the other, you might be something that you can do, you could do together. Absolutely. Anything else from anybody? I think that's everything. Thanks, Declan. Bye. <laughs> OK, David, I think back to you. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Vicky, for a really valuable presentation. Some great food for thought. And, uh, you know, let's let's crack on and capitalise where we can. Absolutely. Go for it, guys. Now's the time. Yes. Strike while the iron's hot. <laughs> thank you, Vicky. It's a pleasure. Thank you all so much. Lovely to see you all. Cheerio now. Bye.